Right, I shall make a start. Uh, shout out if nobody can hear me. Uh, I think all is all is well at the moment. So I'm calling this one Eyes in the Deep. It's a look at how the technology has evolved over the last uh, really 50, 60 years to the current state of the art in the ability to search for and identify objects on the seabed. I'm particularly going to focus on wrecks of ships, submarines and aircraft in this particular talk. And I thought I'd start things off uh, a little flashback to the past of how I got interested in this whole underwater technology lark in the first place. And back in the 1960s, as a youngster in school, uh, one of the books in the school library was this thing, the Ladybird Achievements book of uh, underwater exploration. So um, marvellous little book with illustrations by... Uh, a chap called B. Knight, uh, whether it's a relation to our very own Ian, who knows, and uh, written by a chap called Richard Bowood. And I, I still have a, a, a copy. It's not the original 1960s copy stolen from the school library, I should hasten to add. This was a, a recent eBay purchase to try, try and find the thing. But it was full of, you know, fa fa fabulous illustrations of, you know, people doing cool underwater stuff and you know submarines and ships and people escaping from sunken submarines all, all kinds of stuff like this and it really switched me on to being interested in this kind of stuff at quite an early age and so as I move through what I'm going to do is um, focus on just a few key areas because there isn't time in an hour to cover the whole world of underwater salvage so I'm going to focus on, you know, the, the early days, the early technology, um, hunting for H-bombs, the loss of the USS Scorpion, a little bit about Titanic, Derbyshire, some more lost aircraft, and then on to some of the future technologies that are coming online right now. Right. Now, sometimes objects, things go wrong very much in public view and uh, here's a photograph of uh, HMS Astute uh, ashore off the Scottish coast uh, a few years ago now uh, happily photographed by all and sundry who who found her there including lots of people in ribs who were getting nice close-up uh, photographs of the usually very secret and classified ducted propulsor up at the tail end and you can even see the uh, uh, the stinger for uh, deploying the towed array. There's all, all kinds of things you're not supposed to show your potential opponents in that particular uh, that particular photograph. So some, sometimes a, a ship or a submarine or an aircraft can be lost in inverted commons in a situation which is pretty visible, you know, and you know, folk are easily able to find where it is. But what happens if it's down there on the deep, deep floor? Now, in the early days, if something had sunk, usually there are eyewitnesses. Uh, if it was anywhere near the coast, uh, there might be people who watched the thing going down from the, the coastline. There might be some survivors. There might be some surface wreckage. And a little after the event, you'd get the, the fishermen, for example, would quickly discover uh, where there were wrecks because they were often some of the best places for fishing, you know, with uh, large, healthy, uh, large, large, healthy fish you know, hiding in the nooks and crannies. On the ship. If you were blessed to be in an area with high cliffs or um, you know, other such vantage points, sometimes you could see an object was on the sea floor from the coast. It might be shallow enough to be able to dive with breath hold diving and go down and have a look. Sometimes you could just feel around the place, you know, with your, your bare feet. You could have the proverbial bucket with a glass uh, panel at the end. If you hooked something, you grabbed it. And some of those early salvage uh, uh, pe people did some astonishing work. There was a chap called um, Lethbridge, for example, who used a, a diving barrel, basically a wooden barrel with a, a glass viewport. It was a, a very successful uh, salvor in the, in the early days, just being his arms poking through leather, leather sleeves in his wooden uh, bucket, uh, sealed, sealed with grease. And his dives could only last as long as the, uh, the air inside the wooden bucket. So a very, very, very brave, brave man, reliant upon his uh, son with the rope to pull him up at the end of his 
each mission. And salvage technology, until the invention of um, sonar techniques in the early 20th century, salvage hadn't really progressed hugely. Um, people were able to raise sunken ships. They could uh, seal the holes, pump in air, uh, you know, use human divers to go down there and refloat a sunken ships up to quite a large size. Uh, many of you will be familiar with the story of what happened in a scap of flow, for example, uh, the the raising of the German fleet after after the Great War and uh, other such activities. But I'm going to focus mainly on the the post-war period here, and the one that even had the picture back in that children's book I showed right at the start that caught my initial attention were the loss of the BOAC Comet airliners in the in the 1950s. Uh, the Brits were the first in the race to bring commercial airliners into uh, jet airliners into commercial service and things got off to a good start but then unfortunately the comets started falling out of the sky and nobody was too sure why because the wrecks were happening over the sea now in the case of this particular one um, the last two initials of its registration were YP in the old phonetic alphabet that was yoke peter it tends to be what the aircraft's known as so BOAC Flight 781, a Comet 1, it exploded at high altitude just 25 minutes after leaving Rome on, uh, in January 1954. 35 lives lost, the comets were grounded because there, at this point there had now been several comet crashes of what had gone on. Now, they were lucky in that it was on relatively shallow sea floor. Uh, this particular point, it was between 140 and 200 metres depth. And fishermen had observed the burning wreckage falling into the sea. So we didn't have this problem of, uh, you know, where on earth is it in the first place? They had a rough idea. Local authorities conducted a search. They found some, some of the bodies. And uh, HMS Barhill and a uh, commercial ship Sea Salva were sent from Malta to recover the wreckage. Depth was, say, 140 to 200 metres. And for the first time, underwater TV equipment was used for the salvage operation. So they, they had a, a human in a uh, uh, ob observation uh, bell. So, so, the, so the, there were human eyeballs down there as well. But also they were using TV equipment and basically grabs and trawls and dredges to try and bring as much of the comet to the surface as possible. And in time, a decent portion of the aircraft was recovered to the surface. And the investigation eventually showed that the, 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 the cause of loss was metal fatigue. The, the aircraft were, of course, aluminium fuselage. It had uh, square cut windows, including for things like the aerials. Uh, fared into the top skin of the aircraft and it was actually a, an automatic direction finder aerial opening cut into the aluminium where that had propagated a crack and with the repeated pressurization and depressurization of the aircraft in surface it, it had failed at that point but by using the the tv equipment in combination with the the, the state of the art equipment of the time it turned out to be possible to recover sufficient of the aircraft to determine its cause of loss and from this point, things begin to really accelerate. I suppose one of the next, uh, oh, sorry, this thing's doing strange, strange stuff. Right, hunting for H-bombs is, is, is my next one. I've spoken to some of the people involved in this who, who were getting on a bit. So January 17th, 1966, uh, B-52 nuclear bomber collided with its air refueling tanker off the Spanish coast managed to drop no less than four uh, basically live, fully armed H-bombs, which in those days were quite big. You know, they were designed for taking out entire cities. Uh, three of them were recovered on land, but one was missing at sea. So what had happened to the missing H-bomb? And at this point, quite an interesting character comes onto the, the scene. There's a fellow called John Pina Craven. He, he died uh, just coming up five years ago now and craven is arguably one of the uh, you know I'd, I'd say craven is one of the great unsung heroes of our underwater technology world he's not nearly as well known as he should be 
uh, considering some of the things this guy did. Uh, he was a he was a project engineer on uh, Polaris, uh, all kinds of systems like this. You know, it, uh, unfortunately, much of what Craven wrote is still classified, so you won't find much of uh, Craven's work out there in the published literature. But there's a terrific amount of his stuff still sat out there in the military archives. Now, Craven was uh, an advocate of using Bayesian statistics to, to find things and by interviewing the the kind of you know drunken local fishermen and people like that that some of the other experts had ignored they managed to locate the missing h-bombs to quite, quite a high level of precision uh, now alvin comes into the scene in this particular story here uh, alvin will come back again later now alvin was the woods hole oceanographic institution deep diving man submersible and the you know hunting for the h bombs off palomares was probably the the first high profile mission for alvin uh, she'd been in service for a couple of years by then but this gave them opportunity to use a manned vehicle to go down there and see if they could find it there was also a private sector vehicle uh, from the i think it was the reynolds corporation uh, known as illuminaut Unfortunately, I can't find many colour photographs of Illuminor because I, I, I'm told she was painted a beautiful bright orange. Uh, so so uh, she looked quite quite good in uh, in the pictures if I can find a decent orange photograph of her. But uh, Illuminor and Alvin did their thing down there on the seafloor trying to find the wreck of the uh, the wreck of the missing H bomb. But in the end, the although Alvin did find her. Uh, tried, tried, tried to grab her with a manipulator claw and the, the bomb basically slipped away into deeper water. And uh, after discussion, it was decided it might not be the wisest thing to use a civilian manned submarine to try and retrieve a potentially still live H-bomb. Uh, so maybe we ought to use one of the early ROVs to do it. And in comes this vehicle, Curve, which was the st stands for the Cable Controlled Underwater Recovery Vehicle. It's a US Navy system designed for retrieving torpedoes. And uh, the Curve team uh, eventually got down there, found the H-bomb, and they were supposed to mark it and then leave it uh, for Alvin or one of the other submarines to actually bring back to the surface. Uh, U.S. Navy weren't having any of that. You know, they they, they were going to get the glory of bringing the uh, the H bomb back up. So, um, speaking to a, a technician involved at the time, he tells me they they basically put the uh, thrusters into full reverse, sucked the parachute shrouds that were holding the H bomb into the into the propulsors, entangling curve beautifully with the the unexploded weapon. So, I had to retrieve uh, curve and bomb to the surface uh, together uh, where uh, they were able to inspect it. And there, there, there is the, uh, the casing of the bomb on the, uh, on the recovery vessel with uh, the US Navy making sure that Curve has a uh, pride of place in the recovery photograph. And the, the bomb casing, minus the live parts of course, is still on display to this day at the M Museum of Nuclear Weapons in Albuquerque New Mexico, looking a bit uh, battered and dented after it's dropped to the, the the bottom of the Mediterranean, but it was again a, another nice example of using sort of high technology to find and recover a, a sunken weapon system. So moving quickly on to the Scorpion. Scorpion's an increasingly well-known story now, but she was lost 1968 on her way home from the Mediterranean. Uh, she'd been doing some uh, NATO work out in the Med and disappeared last message somewhere in the vicinity of the Azores 21st of May 1968. Six days later didn't turn up as expected at her base in Norfolk Virginia so the search was on to find out where on earth Scorpion was. Now the problem being uh, submarines by the nature of what they do don't go around telling the world their location and to be honest nobody had the foggiest idea where Scorpion actually was. So they knew she'd left the med. They knew she was on her way to Norfolk, Virginia, and they knew that she had sent a message somewhere in the vicinity of the Azores, and that was about it. And Craven and his team come back into the picture again using their clever statistics. 
but also using the network of um, sonar arrays that have been put into the Atlantic in the 1960s to detect uh, Soviet submarines. And after some hunting, they eventually found a, a sound on, on one of the tapes, which could possibly have been the noise of a, a submarine breaking up. It was a single pop followed a few minutes later by additional ones, but they only had one bearing. Uh, so they then found another recording from a station in, I think it was in Newfoundland or, or somewhere like that, uh, where they were able to find, on the, uh, you know, within so many minutes of the noises recorded on the first set of tapes, a similar set of sounds. And between the two, they were able to start getting a, a bearing on the possible area where the submarine would be found. And indeed, there's a picture. That's the last photo of Scorpion uh, on, on the surface. So the, the ship Mizar was uh, dispatched to go, go out hunting. They knew she was going to be somewhere to the southwest of the Azores, but they only had a rough area of, of quite a few uh, tens of square miles. And they used a deep sea camera sled to see if they could find the wreck of the Scorpion. But of course, this isn't television, this is using photographic film. So it meant having to tow the sled back and forth on a, a mowing the lawn pattern, to see, you know, and then retrieving it, processing the film, cross-checking them against the positions on the, the ship's navigation log, to see if they could find where the actual wreck of the scorpion lay. Uh, eventually, some debris was sighted, and the Bathyscaphe Trieste of diving the Marianas Trench fame was dispatched to go down and photograph the wreckage in more detail. And here's one of the 1968 photos of the, uh, the bow of the sunken scorpion. She dug herself into the mud down on the seabed, she was broken up into at least three pieces. There were one or two clues, though. The, the, the periscope was extended, you know, as if the submarine had been on the surface when whatever mishap happened had happened. Uh, the running lights on the, on the sail were extended. Um, one of the strange things, though, is that the orientation of the wreck is pointing due east and you would have expected her to be pointing west as she was on her way home to uh, Norfolk, Virginia at the time. So with the technology of, of the 60s, although they were able to find the wreck, at that point they weren't able to determine cause of loss. So keep Scorpion in your minds, and we're going to come back and revisit her again shortly. Now, on a similar period, a Russian submarine, seems like 1968 was a good year for losing submarines, and the, the, the Russians lost one called K129, northwest of Hawaii, uh, March the 8th, 1968. Now, the, the US had five bearing lines from the, the underwater sound arrays and were able to find the, uh, the wreck fairly quickly. But the Russians, who didn't have the same technology in the Pacific Ocean at the time, were, were looking in completely the wrong place. And this greatly puzzled uh, the U.S. team. So they thought, well, why are the Russians looking somewhere else for their missing submarine? It was, this, was this one up to something that even its superiors were, were, you know, were unaware of the mission? It also occurred to people that a Russian submarine, now she wasn't nuclear powered, but she was nuclear armed. This one was carrying three, three nuclear tipped missiles. And... The intelligence services got quite excited at the thought that there was a possibly fairly intact Russian submarine on the seabed northwest of Hawaii, carrying not just Russian nuclear weapons, but presumably Russian code books and other things like that as well. And the Russians didn't seem to know where she was. So this might have been rather a good uh, target to go and investigate and uh, potentially recover. So back in the 60s, one of the earliest generation of U.S. nuclear submarines, the Halibut, had been converted for special operations. Uh, she was carrying side thrusters. Um, she was able to dynamically position. She had a saturation diving ha habitat, was designed to be able to park herself on the seabed, all, all kinds of features. And Halibut was able to put to deploy camera sledges, similar to the things that the, uh, the Mizar had been using for hunting the scorpion 
but by doing so from a submerged nuclear submarine, any, anyone watching on the surface wouldn't even be aware that there was a search operation going on down there on the, on, on the seabed. And to cut a long story short, Halibut found the wreck, they photographed it. It was not in great condition, but it looked potentially recoverable and possibly the greatest salvage mission humankind has ever attempted got kicked off when the uh, CIA decided to fund an operation to recover the whole wreck of the, the K-129, and hopefully without anybody figuring out what was going on. So they, they went to Howard Hughes, they had the uh, uh, Glomar Explorer built with a beautiful cover story about it being about um, manganese nodule mining which inadvertently kicked off the race towards the 1972 and 1982 UN conventions on the law of the sea, uh, because a few countries kicked up a fuss that it wasn't fair that a developed first world country was going to go and commence doing deep sea mining and nobody else had the technology. And the, the whole story had actually been the cover for raising the wreck of the K129 anyway. So um, the ship got built, uh, hanging underneath the ship, was a lifting device uh, known as uh, Clementine with a, with a bunch of claws. Uh, I have actually found a better v version of this uh, drawing in recent years. I, might, I must update this, but Clementine was designed to sort of go down, grab the wreck of the K129 and uh, bring it up, uh, hold it against the underside of the, of the mothership and place the wreck into the Hughes mining barge the mining barge being the, uh, the, the vehicle that had been built to hold the manganese nodules, according to the cover story, but of course, in reality, the, uh, the wreck of the K129. Um, depending on who you speak to, the wreck either broke into three pieces on its way up. Other people maintain it was uh, recovered pretty much intact. So we don't know to this day in the unclassified literature exactly how much a K129 was recovered. But eventually, the Walker spy ring uh, operating within the um, uh, the U.S. Navy, let on to the Russians what the Americans were up to, and they were basically uh, warned off by the Soviet embassy to you know stop fooling around with our well, it's a, it's a, it's a war grave really. And back in the period, I think it was when Yeltsin was um, president. So after the fall of the USSR. Uh, Clinton did hand over to the Russians a, a videotape showing Russian crew being given um, an honourable uh, burial at sea, you know, with full, full military honours, uh, back in uh, the, the period when this recovery operation was going place. So certainly enough of the submarine was recovered, the bodies were found, and uh, who knows what other components were uh, returned to the National Security Agency. So this just gives you an idea again of the, uh, the you know the the, the size of the uh, of the operation, and in fact the Hughes mining barge uh, carried on its service for many many years. And there's a, a picture of her here on the left, uh, being used as the uh, the dock for Sea Shadow, which was an experimental stealth ship that the U.S. Navy operated for a few years. So the Hughes mining barge did did find itself. Uh, uh, you know, with uh, li life after its first phase of classified operations by uh, becoming the the uh, covered over dock for another kind of classified operation. So, keeping briefly into this this line of where where, where the, the the military really were at the cutting edge of some of the deep diving. Uh, recovery technologies. Here's an artist's impression of the nuclear submarine NR1, which was the the only uh, U.S. nuclear submarine not to be known as USS, you know, X, Y, or, or Z. She was simply NR1, uh, built using uh, money sidelined from other projects as a uh, black ops again back in the back in the 60s. And NR1. A small nuclear power uh, designed to spend very, very long periods on station with, uh, she had tractor wheels, retractable, uh, retractable tractor uh, wheels underneath, so she was able to roll along on the seabed. Uh, she had manipulator arms, collection baskets, uh, deep water camera systems, and a number of very advanced features considering the point in history where she was built. And 
She was launched back in January 1969 and remained in service right through to uh, October 2008. And uh, Bob Ballard of uh, Woods Hole fame and, you know, Titanic recovery uh, or, or discovery fame. Uh, was one of the U.S. Naval Reserve officers that served regularly on board uh, NR1. And he was able to use her to do some uh, quite quite civilian-orientated research in places like the Black Sea well into the uh, 90s and the early 2000s as well. Uh, very basic kind of ship to be working on board. Uh, you can sort of see the nature of the accommodation in the photograph on the left there, which is simply sleeping bags, uh, within the same uh, crew quarter as the folk driving and operating the the submarine, uh, she was unarmed. She certainly wasn't designed for long uh, long duration deployments, and would be towed into position by a surface mothership because her forward speed was quite slow. But once launched, she was able to uh, carry on for uh, quite extended periods at sea. So. Technology starts moving on from this period in the 60s. We had side scar sonar becomes developed, which lets you look at large areas of the seafloor in uh, much more detail than, than used to be the case. And the examples here of the, the typical side scan sonar profiles that you would see as you're, as you're mowing the lawn. In this particular case from the Mark I, uh, no, that would be a Mark II or three glorious system that used to be deployed out of the old Institute of Oceanographic sciences in Wormley. And these were low resolution systems. They would enable you to map large areas of seafloor, but what they couldn't do was uh, find small objects. So they, they basically, okay, if you're trying to find something big like a battleship or a tanker, you might find that, but not suitable for smaller targets. But then the technology carries on advancing. We start moving into the multi-beam uh, bathymetry systems that we use today, able to measure to you know much uh, higher levels of precision. You start getting uh, great advances in the development of the remote operated vehicles and submersible camera systems. And you know by the time we get into the late 90s and the early 2000s, the quality of the imagery you start being able to pick up from the sea floor is, is almost photographic. Uh, as you can tell in this particular image, you're down to one meter by one meter size targets being clearly identifiable in the, the footage from the seafloor. So the, the state of the art evolves very rapidly with the remote operated vehicles. They begin being used by obviously the offshore industry that many of us are familiar with, but they also start being picked up as tools for offshore ocean science as well as the, their original home in the uh, defense community. Uh, Ballard famously in, in the 80s discovers the, the, the wreck of the Titanic in conjunction with collaborators from the, uh, the French um, IFREMER, the, uh, the French research organization. But Ballard wasn't out trolling around the North Atlantic trying to find Titanic. He was basically under contract to revisit the 1968 wreck of Scorpion using more advanced te uh, technology to see if they could figure out what had sunk her back in the day. And here is one of the images from, it's the same mission where Ballard and his team found Titanic on their way home. And this is one of the uh, seafloor images of, of Scorpion down there on the seafloor from 1986. And you can just about make out in this shot the way that the, the hull of Scorpion is telescoped. Um, in this particular shot, the, the line towards the left of the photograph is, is the, the cylinder of the hull where this, this final tapered section is, 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 you know, telescoped inwards violently as the submarine headed down towards the, uh, the, the depths of the North Atlantic. So, um, so revisiting with uh, some of the state-of-the-art equipment available by the, the 80s did give them a much better idea of the, the, the state of the wreckage. It also shows some other interesting clues. The very, very low rates of sedimentation in the North Atlantic, for example. I mean, these pictures are taken best part of 20 years apart. There's no appreciable sedimentation or, or build-up on the, on the seafloor. 
there's been no disturbance. There was certainly no evidence of the Soviets having interfered uh, with the wreckage in, in the period since the US had, had visited. But there were some questions. I mean, for example, why is there a big chunk missing out of the base of the sail there? And the, the torpedo tubes are buried in the mud. So what we don't know is are any of the torpedo tube doors open on on the scorpion and that's not known to this day um but the the um, what's believed to have happened and you, you get an idea here is that as, as she as she began to sink as you can see from the artist's impression the you know the stern end uh telescoped into the the forward part uh it would have been a pretty quick um final few moments for the crew uh you know the, the, the pressure build up for, for something like that to happen it would have been a pretty instantaneous passing and that's kind of the the state she's found in on the seabed at the moment and there are there are two or three theories as to what actually happened to scorpion the most popular and this tends to be backed up by the fact she's pointing east on the seabed rather than west is she might have possibly been some one of her own torpedoes uh, this was certainly the theory that Craven and uh, the U.S. Navy adopted. Um, the, the Mark 37 torpedoes that were carried by the Skipjack-class submarines apparently had a nasty habit of occasionally commencing a hot run, where they, they basically start going off uh, while they were still on board the, the parent vessel. And the way you disarm these kind of torpedoes is to turn through turn through 180 degrees because the, the failsafe on the torpedo is designed not to sink the submarine that launched it. So if it goes through 180 degrees, uh, change of direction from the point when it was launched, they would normally disarm. And the fact that uh, scorpions found on the seabed pointing east when she should have been traveling west was tended to hint that they were they had either launched the to a faulty torpedo and were trying to run away from it, or if they couldn't launch it, they still turned through 180 degrees so that the onboard compass inside the torpedo would detect the change in direction and cease to do the hot run. Now she went down, she's got two nuclear tip torpedoes on board and of course a fully fueled nuclear reactor. There's no discernible uh, levels of radiation down there on the seabed ar ar around the wreck. Uh, very, very low levels when you get to within a few meters of it. And I, I did some work in the, in the 90s on uh, disposal of uh, and long-term storage of decommissioned nuclear submarines and, and Scorpion, Thresher and the various ex-Soviet ones lying around the seabed did teach us quite a lot about the, the relatively low rates of radiation release that you do tend to get from uh, fueled nuclear submarines down there on the seabed. Quickly on to the Derbyshire, um, only four years old when she was lost with all hands during Typhoon Orchid in September 1980. No distress calls made, but she had sister ships which subsequently suffered structural failures at a particular point in the hull known as Frame 65. And this always led to a, a long question that hung over the community. Was there a design flaw which had sunk the Derbyshire? Uh, so very unusually, the operation to try and uh, find the wreck was funded by a trade union. Uh, I think it's probably the, the only major salvage operation of its kind funded by a trade union, in this case the International Transport Federation, uh, funded the initial search for the wreck using Sidescan Sonar and RMV. She was found after just 23 hours of searching in, in the area where oil had been up uh, welling you know, in 1980. Very deep water. She was found at 4,200 metres and the, the images showed uh, quite clearly that she was indeed the wreck of the Derbyshire. And again, you get an idea of the kind of quality of images that 1980s technology was returning of um, wrecks down there on the seabed. But one of the interesting features, here is the top side of the bow. And you notice it's not, the bow is not buckled or crumpled. You know, she's in pretty good condition down there on the seabed. And when you find that in deep water wreckage, it tells you straight away that that was already flooded when it hit the seafloor. 
if you look at the sections on the previous page, which are all just metal core flakes, if something's been crushed flat like that, it means you had air spaces on board, which have been squished as the, as the, you know, as the wreck heads down towards the deep sea floor. When you have an area like that, which isn't crushed, it means it was already flooded. Uh, so it already gives you a clue about, it's the fore end of the ship, which is beginning to flood. And then the tail ends going down unflooded. And the images just got better and better as uh, you know the systems were were, were put down, um, and they were good enough. Uh, you see from these ones that they were able to find the metal that had actually cracked as the hull had failed. You know, so they were actually able to get right down to the sections of the hull where the where the, where the failure had taken place, and between that initial uh, visit to the wreck and the subsequent expeditions in 97 and 98. So over 135,000 images were taken over 200 hours of video. And it found quite conclusively that Derbyshire had not actually failed at frame 65, unlike some of her sister ships. And that what had happened was that the hatch on the number one cargo hold had failed under the weight of Typhoon Orchid's heavy seas. Uh, as the hatch failed, it filled the forward cargo hold. And then as the, the bow end of the ship was uh, go, going into the sea, the subsequent hatches failed in a cascade manner as the, the, the hull began to, to fill up. So again, even though she was down there in over 4,000 meters, it was possible to piece together the sequence of failures which led to the loss of, of the Derbyshire. Now here's an example of a submarine that actually returned from a rather serious incident. Many of you might have seen this picture over the years. This was the USS San Francisco, which managed to hit a sea mount that wasn't on any of the charts, uh, doing something of the order 30 knots uh, or southwest of Guam uh, a few years ago. And astonishingly, I think only one, possibly two crew actually lost their lives in this particular incident. Um, testimony to the the damage control skills and reserve buoyancy that had been built into this class of submarine, and um, it shows you in this side by side side photograph. You get a nice impression here too of how different the construction techniques are between um, Russian classes of submarine and uh, the the typical construction used by the West. In the in the this would be a Los Angeles class in the case of the San Francisco and an Oscar II class uh, Soviet submarine on the other side. Um, the Russians tend to use a very sturdy double hull construction, partially because their submarines are operating in icy waters, so it's useful having that, uh, that extra layer of security and safety. But it does also mean that they're, they're quite well protected against anti-submarine torpedoes, uh, because effectively they have spaced armor you know, by having the exterior hull and then a separate interior one. Moving on to Air France 447, uh, I was involved in uh, aspects of the search for this one. Uh, she went down, she was only four years old, uh, this is back in 2009, and was lost to touch with pretty much over the mid, heading towards the mid-Atlantic ridge, uh, just a few hours into the, into the journey. Uh, so we had a pretty good idea of where she'd gone down, but it still took nearly two years to find the to find the wreck. Uh, you know, bits that float were found pretty much straight away. In this case, the uh, the tail fin, and the uh, that's one of my photographs. One of the French nuclear submarines leaving um, Brest uh, up at, up at the top. But the the initial search area was six thousand seven hundred square miles. They they quickly recovered about fifty bodies and a thousand items of debris. You know, like um, uh, things that float, like seats and such like. But they hit this problem, and it's the same one that affected uh, MH370 a few years later, of essentially 1960s, early 70s technology being used for the locator beacons. Uh, civilian airliners are fitted with a, uh, a kind of echo sounder that basically runs out of battery after only 30 days. Uh, they, they, they run out of battery life after only 30 days. It's constantly pinging. And the 
frequency used isn't really got enough oomph behind it to penetrate to the sea surface if you're down at full ocean depth. Um, it's state of the art circa 1966, 67 technology. And there are far, far better things we could do today if, if, if we were uh, building such a, such a system. So it took until May 2011 to find the wreckage. Large sections were recovered and they showed pretty conclusively that the, uh, the, the aircraft hit the water belly first. She seems to have come down rather like a sycamore leaf, uh, very, very little forward airspeed at all. Uh, sm the, the bodies, uh, many of whom were still strapped into their, their seats uh, when, when the wreckage of the aircraft were found, uh, most of them had spinal compression type, type injuries. They were very well preserved uh, because the, the ship was in, uh, the, uh, the wreck was in uh, deep, deep water, uh, very low oxygen levels, and uh, uh, they were um, safe from marine uh, organisms by the, uh, by the airframe. Because the airframe had hit basically belly, belly first, uh, filled with water, sunk so, so down the seabed. Turned out it was uh, icing in the, in the pito heads, uh, combined with situational uh, disorientation for the air crew, which had actually caused the aircraft to be to be lost. And the, uh, the this leads on to a, a, a similar similar technology with SAA Flight Two Nine Five, which had been lost a few years even before that, back in eighty seven, which was a combined freight and passenger flight from Taiwan to Johannesburg. And in the case of this aircraft, again, bodies were found on the sea surface quite quickly, and the postmortem showed they had uh, soot in their, in, in their lungs and other evidence of fire. Now, the aircraft had been carrying six large uh, freight pallets. Again, the, it took them a little while to find the, uh, the wreck. The first two months search by the South African authorities wasn't successful, so Oceaneering uh, were contracted to find the wreckage. Uh, they did eventually find three debris fields, by which point it was over a year since the, the crash. Never got the flight data recorder, but they did find the cockpit voice recorder, which had um, basically sounds, noises from fire alarms, circuit breakers tripping. The inquiry showed that the fire detection extinguishing systems weren't good enough uh, the operation, the, the discovery of the wreck led to the cessation of combination of freight and passenger operations for, for most airlines. And it's, um, there's a strong belief that what might have happened in this particular system is the aircraft was, this is back in the apartheid era, uh, the old South African government, and it's believed the aircraft might have been carrying uh, anti-aircraft missile components from Taiwan uh, back to Johannesburg, and the uh, there was a malfunction in the missile components. The, these are the things that led to the led to the fire. Uh, it wasn't certainly wasn't in the official uh, version of the aircraft's loss, but this is what's generally believed in the community was that she was brought down by flammable cargo. So again, it led to some quite significant changes in the uh, regulations for the, uh, the kind of cargo you can carry and uh, the separation from passengers and such forth. So a little shot there just showing how uh, our dear little friend Alvin that we showed right back in the search for the H-bombs at the start of the talk is still alive and well and diving. She's now uprated to a new four and a half thousand meter hull. Still not as deep as the six and a half thousand meter on the Russian Mir 1 and Mir 2 vehicles but still going strong. But the the state of the art now for finding these submerged objects is progressing pretty quickly. I was involved very much with the, the National Oceanography Center's auto sub program in the, in the 90s and the 2000s, um, which could certainly have been fitted with equipment for finding the, uh, the, the, the pinger sounds on uh, deep diving or deep lost wrecks. Ocean Hearing's new Freedom vehicle, I uh, picked it down there on the bottom left, uh, would be a, a classic kind of system today for being able to go out and examine and retrieve wreckage. It's able to operate as an autonomous underwater vehicle, but then when it finds a target area, it can hover, it can inspect, it can take samples and bring them back to the surface. 
And of course, we now have a, a family of smaller, almost launch and forget type vehicles, like the Eco Sub from, um, I think that's one of Planet Ocean's uh, product lines. And uh, here we have our, our, our dear friend Boris uh, playing with one on the Southampton dockside uh, in one of his visits down to N NOC. Not just us, of course, that are building systems able to do these kind of unmanned retrievals and reconnaissance of what's going on on the seabed. You have uh, here's pictures of two of the new Chinese, uh, two of the new Chinese systems down here. Now, as we move into the last couple of slides, the technology now for detecting and measuring objects on the seabed is is becoming tremendously improved just in the last couple of years, uh, certainly the last five. Um, we're now using uh, laser scanning techniques, new high frequency sonar scanning techniques. Here's a November class. Uh, Russian nuclear submarine on the, the floor of the Barents Sea from uh, this image from ADAS technology. And a couple of pictures here of the wreck of the uh, Richard Montgomery in the Thames estuary, uh, one with conventional multi-beam bathymetric uh, techniques, that's the one with all the wild colours, and then the other one using uh, laser 3D um, scanning and uh, photogrammetry systems. And that's good enough to even show you individual gun mounts and uh, uh, structural damage. So powerful new techniques for looking at the shape of the seafloor. And the very latest, I'm just gonna show you a clip now to a YouTube video from, uh, oh, can you see this? Are you, uh, can, can you nod Elaine, you seen the YouTube video? Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll make it full screen. This is a, uh, a Douglas Devastator aircraft down on the seafloor. And in this case, they're using a mixture of human divers and uh, robotic systems to scan the, the state of the, uh, the wreck down there. And this is what you get, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing. This is a combination of uh, laser scanning and uh, photogrammetry, 92 million points of data. You know, right down to individual corrosion holes in the, in the propellers and airframe. Now, the first time I saw this image, uh, I was astonished. You know what you can now do with these new, these new techniques. So you can find out more there by going to the uh, th uh, the website of the of the contractor. There you go, three D at depth. And we'll be able to find you the links to that. Okay. So, so my final slide, if you're seeing the picture, is just showing that, oops, <laughs> there's a, a, a photograph here of the USS uh, Jimmy Carter. Um, we showed pictures of the Halibut earlier and the various submarines that have been used to investigate objects down there on the seafloor. And the, the Carter, which is one of the three Seawolf built, uh, the Seawolf class submarines, which, which were by far the most advanced of the US. Uh, Navy's fleet uh, was built from the outset as a special ops submarine when she has chambers for autonomous underwater vehicles for camera systems for all kinds of stuff so she's able to get right down there and uh, you know discover objects on the deep sea floor and uh, retrieve investigate and discover so I shall end that one there There's my email address Steve Hall at sut.org if people would like to ask me uh, any questions after this is over. Uh, for those who haven't listened yet, we now have a weekly podcast series, which you'll find at uh, sut.buzzsprout.com or on your favorite podcast provider, uh, be that Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, etc. So I shall end that there.